it is Super Bowl Sunday, and as I lay the foundation for today's message, um, I think about the teams that are playing, the Eagles and the Patriots, and uh, maybe some of the, the, some of you are fired up about that. I mean, I was like fired up when the Jaguars were going, but now it just kind of doesn't even matter. But um, so you, you think about the game, you think about the players, right? So there's some big names, obviously, that are playing out there. Tom Brady, you love him or hate him. Guys like Gronkowski, I mean, that guy's just had an amazing, amazing career. On the other side, Foles, who I understand through an article, is uh, planning on becoming a pastor when he retires from football. Pretty cool, pretty commendable, um, pretty neat thing, right? But when you think of the names of even the teams or these key players, uh, maybe roll the clock forward 50 years from now. Do you think we'll still be talking about them? Maybe even next year, a year from now, very few in this very room will even remember the score of the game or who played during the game, right? But the subject material that we're talking about today is eternal in nature. In fact, we're one of what Hebrews talks about as the hall of fame of faith. So one of the guys that we're going to be studying the life and his, the promises that God gave him is none other than Abraham. And we're still talking about Abraham 4,000 years later. So there's an amazing thing that I hope we'll witness today in Scripture as we talk about the promises of God. Can we trust in what God says, or will we take some shortcuts maybe at different points in our life and uh, just see what God has to say this morning? So, Lord, we gather together. What a wonderful time it was worshiping you in song. Your presence was tangible in this place. And Lord, you're just touching and changing lives. You continue to save. You continue to deliver. People continue to be set free, even in our own generation and in this very church. And we can't be thankful enough for that. Lord, you continue to move. And your promises, as we will see today, are yes and amen. When you promise something, it is unstoppable. No human power, no demonic power can stop it, for you are in control of all things. Our destinies are assured in you. Would we be a people who are part of this church, who trust in you, can handle that wait time in between the speaking of a promise and the realization of a promise without attempting to take some shortcuts on our own? Lord, would we learn these things and would we be able to apply them and put them into practice in our lives, the things that we hear this very morning in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Amen. So if you're just joining us today, uh, we started a new series this year called Epic. It's going to last really throughout the course of the entire year. We're going to break it down into different months and study different subject material. But the premise is that we're going to hit about 50 of the major stories and themes of the Bible during the course of the year. If you started your Bible reading, uh, hopefully you've gotten through the book of Genesis is where we're going to really begin to wrap up today. If you haven't, go ahead and continue to read through it. I'm telling you, God's word is alive and it is true. And when you read it, it will do something to you. It'll change you. It'll transform you. For those of you who are caught up, begin to read through the book of Exodus because that's where we're going to spend most of our time during the month of February. We're going to be talking about some incredible stories like Moses, the children of Israel going out into the wilderness, the parting of the Red Sea. We're going to get to experience a lot in God's word that we'll be able to apply in our life. But today I told you we're going to talk about a Hall of Famer. One that doesn't last for just a short time, but one whose life and story has endured for thousands of years, none other than Abraham himself. We're going to hear about the promises that God made to him. In fact, you're going to really focus on four of those promises and see if there's any application to those things in our life. If they came true in his life, can we trust God as well and believe him for the promises that we know that God has spoken to us? Or are we going to take detours along the way? And maybe if God has us in a little bit of a holding pattern, we try to go out there and we do things on our own. I don't know if you have ever experienced with that, but maybe did anybody ever get in trouble trying to do it your way rather than God's way? The rest of you are stone cold liars. I mean, we all try to take shortcuts from time to time. And we're going to realize today that there's some interesting challenges as a result of that. So let's dive right into God's word, Genesis Chapter 12, verse 1, we're going to hear the first of the four promises. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, um, for those of you who may be new to the faith, Abram and Abraham are the same guy. God ends up changing his name a little bit later in the story. Abraham means father of many nations, and he changes his name. So at this stage, we're seeing him as Abram. Before that name change has taken place, he says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred to your father's house to the land that I will show you. So this first promise surrounds the land, the land of Israel. 
I don't know about you, but what I've sensed, maybe in an American context, but probably universal if you take what God's saying here, there's something in each of our hearts about a land or a place that God has put on our heart. Some of us have been blessed in our lives to maybe realize it and get a glimpse of that. Um, Mary Jo and I moved out to the country a few years ago. Uh, We were city folk. We're still learning, I'm telling you. We are learning, Um, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. But we are learning what, it, it, what it's like to live out there. And it's not always easy. Some of it is a challenge. But there's something that happens the second we round and get on that dirt road. You can't keep your cars clean around here. Come on, Jesus. I mean, you live in the country. There's no saving your car. Um, you go out there and you turn into where uh, we drive off that dirt road. Even our dogs get excited. I mean, if the dog's in the car... You get on that dirt road and the dog will just pop up and he knows that you're almost home. So we get out there and we drive through that driveway and then all of a sudden we just know that we're home. We're at the place that God's given us and we love it out there. And, and you know, you, when you're out there, you're like, I don't know if I want to even come into the city. Let me just stay out there. But there's these things called bills that you still have to pay. So you got to drive out of there and you got to come in and you've got to work still, right? But there's something about it that he plants in each of our hearts. And here you're talking about something so much bigger in this particular scripture God's saying that he's going to give a particular land to a people group, his chosen people, the people of Israel. And, you know, I think that if you study the history of that, and maybe I'll do a little bit of a history lesson. Some of you may know it already. Others of you may not know it. But when you think of this promise coming true, it gives me hope in so many other areas of my life as well. Because when you look at the obstacles that are out there to this promise coming true, if God can deliver in the midst of the things that I'm about to tell you, whatever your challenge is, I'm telling you, he can deliver. You see, some of you who are here, this may have been one of the worst weeks in your entire life. It's been a week full of challenge. It's been a week full of pain. For others of you, it's been a hard couple of months. And you're like, God, where are you in this? I thought you said this was going to happen. Why is it not happening? For others of you, it might be a couple years, like you're ready to scratch off 2017. I mean, you're just ready to mark it off the calendar as as if it didn't even exist, right? You look back and you're believing God for something and it just hasn't materialized yet. And you're like, God, why? One of the things I'd say right from the beginning is maybe he's saving you from something. Don't shortcut God's plans. Don't shortcut God's plans and try to get ahead of yourself because there are consequences to that. It's very difficult to wait. We live in a microwave generation. The microwave has been around since like the 70s as far as I know. And man, it ain't fast enough for me. I don't know about you. But now you got to put something in there even for five minutes. I'm like, can't my food be ready yet? I mean, like, come on, Jesus. Like, we, we live in this generation where we want what we want when we want it. And in recovery circles, they give us some wisdom that's very painful. And they say, you'll get what you get when you get it. And thankfully, God's ways are different than our ways. And and the hardest part I've found really is the timing of that. The timing between the giving of the promise and the receiving of the promise is where the difficulty is at for each of us. So what about the people of Israel? Would God fulfill this promise of giving them this land? In fact, he does. We're going to read in just a few minutes that God brings them to the land. He shows them. At that time, it's called the land of Canaan, which becomes the land of Israel. He takes Abraham to that place where he could see it tangibly. And the first thing he's going to do is he's going to worship there. But would they be able to keep it? Would would it be a place that they would stay, this eternal home that God would talk to them about? In fact, as you fast forward a little bit into the book of Exodus, you start to see that whenever God has a promise and a plan in somebody's life, the devil's going to do everything he can to thwart it. He's going to do everything he can to stop it, right? So what you see is the Jewish people end up becoming captives in the land of Egypt. Do they not? Right? And then Moses, let my people go. We're going to study it in a couple of weeks. So they get there, and then they're multiplying. They're growing. The Jewish people are finding blessing, and then the devil immediately has to try to enslave them. He immediately has to try to kill them. He puts great weights of burden upon them to try to stop God's plan from taking place. He does not want to see them go to the land. That's why, let my people go. Let my people go. He has to repeat it multiple times, and then ultimately it will happen because God will deliver on his promises, right? So they end up later through that story. You know they make it to the land of Israel. They have a time of prosperity, a time of an amazing move of God where they continue to grow as a people and a nation all the way up until Jesus' day. 
They inhabit the land. They're there. They're worshiping God in that context. In fact, if you start to break it down even more granularly, we're going to read a story today about Abraham going up to a place called Mount Moriah. And Mount Moriah is the place where the Temple Mount is, where the Jewish people go. When you see the Western Wall, even today, that is the edge of Mount Moriah. That's the Temple Mount. That's where the sacrifice of Isaac was to take place. And God brings the substitutionary atonement of bringing another lamb in there to be sacrificed, right? Even take it a step further in the place where Jesus is weeping over the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He's in the garden and he's weeping over the people. That's a stone's throw from it. I've stood in the places that I'm telling you about. You can actually see the mount right there, the same place in our generation where they were standing back in those generations. And these stories that we're reading about took place. So they went so far as to try to kill every firstborn of the people of Israel, right? He tries to extinguish them through Pharaoh in that day. And then later on through Herod and Jesus' generation, does he not repeat the same thing? The devil wants to keep them from inhabiting God's promise because if God's promises are true, then people will believe and they will stand on their faith and they will act in Christ and love the real Lord of the universe. So the devil wants to thwart it, does he not? So go back to Jesus' day. Fast forward from the time that we're in, the time of Abraham. God's people are inhabiting the land. And then in Jesus' day, Jesus is crucified on the cross. And you might remember that the Roman Empire is in control of that particular region. So what do they do in that day? They go and they want to kill every single Jew and scatter them among the nations. In fact, they were very successful as the most powerful earthly power that existed in that day, inspired by the devil once again to attempt to kill and annihilate the Jewish people and wipe them off the face of the earth. The last stand of the Jewish people occurred in a place called Masada. It's on the edge of the Dead Sea. I've had the blessing of being there and standing in that very place and seeing where 300 people gave their lives. The last remaining people that were Jewish in the land of Israel stand stand on this mountain in a place called Masada. They're surrounded by legions of Romans, and they literally hold them off for years. When you hear the backstory, the Romans actually occupied it. They snuck in. They took over this fortress that they had, and then it took the Romans years to ultimately come on them. They refused to allow themselves to die at the hands of the Romans and end up committing suicide themselves rather than going into the hands of the Romans. They're the last Jewish people to inhabit the land of Israel. The land sits for some 1,900 years. The Turkish Ottoman Empire moves in and Palestine begins to be birthed as they go when they overtake the land that was given to the Jewish people in those days, right? So the land's there. Where's the promise? God, where are you at? You've been silent for 1,900 years. The devil seems to be getting the victory. Where's God? The Jewish people are not in the land of Israel. This promise is not true. God's timing is different than our timing, right? Then around 1900, maybe a little bit earlier than that, there's a guy, a young boy in the land that today, England, Britain, he's reading the Bible, and he starts to hear about this plight of the Jewish people. He hears about this land of Israel. He reads about the same promises that we're reading, and God implants something in the heart of this young man that said, I want to see the Jewish people return to their land. God raises up this young man to become none other than General Allenby of the British Army, who defeats the Ottoman Empire and in 1917 helps sign the Balfour Declaration that says that they're giving a nation to the people of the land of Israel. The Jewish people would be given back a homeland after 1900 years of non-existence. A language, an ancient language called Hebrew, right? No language has ever gone away from the face of the earth and come back to be a national language. I mean, you get glimpses like the Roman Empire, right? Today, when we're watching football, they have L-I-I or something like that, right? That's the 50 whatever it is, right? And tribute to that old nation, right? There's glimpses of it that we see, but there's not a whole bunch of people walking around speaking Latin. Come on, Jesus, right? That language has gone away, right? No language has ever gone. But God did something through the Jewish people that even while they were scattered throughout the lands, they would still teach their children Hebrew 
And when they came back after 1917 to a place called Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv, a Tel is a mountaintop, a Tel is a hill, an overlook, a place that you could see other places. They come back and begin to inhabit a place in Jerusalem called Tel Aviv. Jerusalem is still far away. It's about an hour drive by car today. They haven't returned all the way to Jerusalem. They haven't returned to Mount Moriah, the place where these stories are taking place. They find themselves in Tel Aviv. They begin to establish a government there. And one of the things that they declare as an edict is every child will be taught Hebrew. And today, if you go to Israel, it's, the, it's a miracle. It's the only nation on the world where an ancient language that had forever gone away had come back to become a national language of the people. It's a miracle. It happened in our own generation, 100 years ago. For 1,900 years, it was gone, right? So fast forward just a little bit further. The devil again attempts to extinguish the Jewish people. Who does he use this time? Not the Roman Empire. He doesn't use the Egyptians. He uses a man called Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler attempts to extinguish every one of the Jewish people. He set out to genocide them. He wanted to wipe them off the face of the earth. And in a strange twist, much like in the land of Egypt, when they were attempting to suppress and kill all of the Jewish people, out of that time, they birthed out and went to this promised land. In the same way, after World War II, the UN declared and gave Israel their land back completely, except for Jerusalem and a few areas that were controlled by Jordan, and they declared the Jewish state to be once again a nation. The Jewish people had a homeland again. And all of a sudden, the Jewish people begin to return from all of the four corners of the earth as predicted in Ezekiel chapter 33 and other places. They begin to come from all over the world to return back to the land. See, in Israel, all you got to do is say the land, and they know what land you're talking about. They've returned back to the land. It is the most important land on the planet. We still talk about it today, do we not? This very uh, week or a couple weeks ago, didn't President Donald Trump declare that they were moving the uh, United States Embassy from Tel Aviv, that starting place of the people of Israel when they returned to none other than Jerusalem, and he said it will be the eternal capital of the Jewish people? No earthly man needs to declare that because let me tell you, God's already declared it in the heavenlies. It don't matter whether an earthly man says it is or is not because it is. The day after the nation is established, a small group of people that had been living there since 1917, in addition to some others who had began to migrate there during the war to try to escape the wrath of Hitler, all the nations that surround them, they do the declaration, they become a nation, they sign their declaration of independence. The very next day, every nation around them attacks them and attempts to send them into the very sea. They didn't have a war machine like they have today. The IDF wasn't established. They didn't, in, in any odds, there's no way that they should have been able to defeat their attackers. But guess what? In miraculous fashion, God confused and confounded the enemies, just like the stories that you read in the Bible. And they ended up being victorious over all the nations that surrounded them. And they began to thrive. But still, Jerusalem was a little far off for them because Jerusalem was still controlled by the Jordanians. And again, they did not initiate the attack that I'm about to tell you about. They responded to the attack that I'm about to tell you about. And in the 1960s, the nations surrounding them once again felt that they were going to push the Jewish people into the ocean and take back over. And in less than seven days, the Jewish people defeated every nation around them once again and took back Jerusalem and pushed back the borders of Jordan, right? How amazing is this? God's prompt, you all are being really quiet. I mean, this is crazy stuff. This is crazy stuff. God declared it 4,000 years ago, and in our generation, we're bearing witness to it. This is amazing stuff. His promises are true. His yeses are yes. His amens are amens. The Jewish people now occupy none other than Jerusalem once again. They occupy the land that was declared to them, right? They occupy it in our generation. We bore witness to this very miracle coming true in our own lives. And let me tell you, if that part's true, then the Bible also speaks of a day where a revived Roman Empire will come and attempt to take over that land once again, and that the Antichrist himself will stand in a future temple that will be built, declaring himself as the abomination of desolation, saying that he is God. But guess what? God is still God, right? <laughs> it ain't going to work for him. 
And it says that Jesus is coming back, and he will come back to that very same place. He'll come back to that same mountain that we were talking about, the same mountain that they were worshiping, the same mountain that we're witnessing right here in the book of Genesis. It's all coming full circle before our very eyes. Would we trust him and not try to move forward on our own? So what are the other three promises? Let me tell you about that for just a moment. Genesis 12, 2. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Let's read on and see if those three come true. You think they're going to come true? I have a feeling they are, right? Because God is God. He is who he says he is. And I promise you, he will come through. See, sadly, human promises are broken so easily that the devil uses that as a means to get us to not trust God. And then what happens is we try to get ahead of ourselves, even as Abraham did, as you'll see here. And there's consequences and ramifications of that as well. So if you skip to Genesis 12, 4, it says, So Abram, Abram went as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai as his wife, or his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions and all that they gathered, the people that they had acquired in Haran, they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to a place of Sashem, to the oak of Moriah, at the time of the Canaanites were in the land. So the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar unto the Lord who had appeared to him. See, in the early days of a promise, it's so easy, is it not? You re- oh, God said it, hallelujah, this is awesome, I'm going to go get it. He goes, he sets up, he begins to worship is the first thing he does when he gets to see the land. He's super excited as we are, but then sometimes there's a little bit of a delay before the promise comes to complete resolution, is there not? So what would he do in the middle of this wait? He said it will be a great nation, which meant that also he would have offspring, but guess what? There's a dilemma, he's 75 years old, people. How many 75-year-olds you seen pregnant? Y'all being real quiet. I mean, they even have men that get pregnant in our generation, apparently. I don't know, you've seen some weird stuff on TV, right? I mean, this is a real miracle, not some crazy fake stuff we're talking about in our generation, right? 75 years old, and God's telling him that he's going to have a baby. You get why he laughs in a little while, right? I mean, he's going to laugh at that situation. His wife's going to laugh at it. But God's going to deliver. I promise you, he will deliver. So now... He finds himself in this waiting game. He finds himself in the same place that some of you are in right now. What would he do in the midst of that? Guess what? He wasn't perfect, which should give us some hope too. He ends up making some mistakes during that waiting period. So one of those mistakes is he found himself encountering a very powerful Egyptian and he's in fear for his life, so he tries to pawn off his wife as his sister because he thinks they're going to kill him. Now, ladies, would you not want to kill your husbands if he did that to you, right? Like, here, you could have her. She's my sister. Ooh, you could take her. You know, you could have her. So he's in fear. He tries to act out on that, right? And he, he, he gives him uh, Sarah, and then God ends up speaking to that person and says, do not take her, do not sleep with her because, you know, she's anointed, Abraham's anointed and God gives him wisdom and thankfully that sin is averted with natural consequences so to speak but there's another one where there was real natural consequences to it see Sarah laughed as well right God told them this is going to happen and she laughs so instead of waiting on God for herself to become pregnant she tells Abraham go sleep with my servant and marry her and when she gets pregnant the son that is had will be as your own son So she tries to avert God's plans. I mean, guys, I want to read the Bible. This stuff's better than like sister wives and all the real real housewives of whatever. I mean, you go read this stuff. There ain't no reality TV in our day that competes with some of the stuff you're going to read up here in God's word, right? And then so much like our own natural relationships. Can you imagine? So she, she ends up, Hagar ends up having a baby. And then Sarah, remember, Sarah's the one who told him to go be with that woman, right? And then now Sarah sees the baby born and sees this relationship happening. All of a sudden, Sarah be getting upset with Abraham. (laughs) And she getting upset with them too and jealous that he had a baby and she didn't, right? So can you imagine poor Abraham over there? You told me to do this. I mean, like, (laughs) what am I doing? Why are you mad at me? You know, I mean, 
this is the stuff of reality television, right? I mean, but this really happened. But guess what? I want to speak of consequences for a moment to maybe share with you that you might be contemplating doing something right now. I pray you haven't jumped over the edge. You might be thinking about doing something that is going to cause you a world of hurt and a world of pain and pain and agony for your family as well. But none other than Hagar, God's promise said they will become a great nation. In fact, he became two great nations of his descendants. One of those was the Israelite people. The other was the Muslim people. So the son of the false son-in-law, or the false son, was the father of the Muslim people who are still warring against Israel even into our very day in our own generation. I'm trying to make it current for you as well. This isn't just some ancient story. The ramifications have now lasted over 4,000 years of the decision that they made to try to get ahead of God's promises. Maybe yours and mine won't last 4,000 years, but if you're contemplating doing something stupid and getting ahead of God, if you're trying to get into a relationship and trying to make it too fast because you're single and you're trying to go out there and you're messing with somebody that ain't God's plan for your life, guess what? You're setting yourself up for a world of hurt. May you avert it. Many of you have already done it. Would you repent? Would you ask God for help? Would you say, Lord, would you forgive me? Many of you are already experiencing the ramifications of pain of trying it your way instead of God's way. Would we as a people and we as Christians understand that there is joy in the midst of the waiting, no matter how painful it might seem in the beginning, God may be protecting you from something. So don't go for that man or woman that you think looks nice. You might just be marrying crazy. Come on, Jesus. He put some, you know, differences in there, some time between decisions to help us with some stuff, right? He cares for you. He loves you. He protects you. He wants to guide you and direct you. And if he could do something like make the land of Israel come from this promise 4,000 years ago and we witness in our day, whatever challenges you're going through, I assure you, he has your back. He loves you. And if you're in the midst of it, let me tell you, wait on the Lord. Don't do something that you're going to regret forever. Genesis 21.5, jumping forward. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God made laughter for me. Everyone hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham and Sarah that they would nurse children? Yes, I have borne him a son in his old age. 25 years later, they end up seeing the promise fulfilled. Don't cheat it and try to get it in 2.5 minutes, you know. Don't cheat it. Trust God. He's got your back. He loves you. He cares for you. And then here's what happens. One of the things that you could expect is when you get that promise is fulfilled in your life, there's going to be some tests that come along with it. So like a mother or a couple who maybe has been trying to have a baby for a number of years, um, and then God gives you that gift of a child, either naturally or through adoption, sometimes what we do in the natural is that baby starts to become an idol for us. Somewhat rightly so, right? You waited so long for that, but then all of a sudden your entire life revolves around that child. Every decision you make revolves around that child. You go to great lengths to do everything to please that child and do everything about that child, and it becomes an idol in your life. The very promise of God that has been delivered, it doesn't have to be that. Maybe it's your business, maybe it's a relationship. That very thing that you were believing for, it turns around into something that it wasn't supposed to be and becomes an idol in your life that needs to be sacrificed on the altar. So God speaks to him and he says, I want you to take your very own son Isaac and I want you to sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. God, are you crazy? It took 25 years to have this baby that you said would be born. Now, this isn't in Scripture. This is how I would react, right? (laughs) God, are you nuts? I mean, I've waited 25 years. I've done everything to protect him. Now he's my boy. I'm going to make sure everything's taken care of. There ain't no way I'm going to go up there and do that. Are you crazy, Lord? But thank God I'm not Abraham. (laughs) He had seen enough in his lifetime and seen enough of God's promises come true that when that moment of testing came, we see in Scripture that he actually, I'm not going to read it here today, but we see that he actually does exactly what God asked him to do. 
He takes Isaac and he puts the wood there with him. He takes the, the fire starter. You know, he goes up and they start to go up the mountain. Then Isaac looks at him like, I know we're supposed to be sacrificing some, but I don't see no lamb around here. What's going on? You know, like, this, this ain't right. You know, something, he already sensed that something wasn't right. And Abraham, his daddy, turns to him and said, God will provide, is what it says in Scripture. God will provide. I'm here to tell you today, 4,000 years after this story, God will provide. Trust him. He will provide. Don't get ahead of yourself. He's going to provide. He's going to provide. We'll see about how he provides, but let me wrap up those last couple of promises. And I will make you a great nation. Today there stands in the land of Israel alone, I think 6.7 million Jewish people. Outside of the land of Israel, there's at least another six point something million people. It says in scripture that those of us who are Christians are grafted into the promise of Abraham. Thus, all of us are children by faith to the promise that was given to Abraham. Right now, there is a couple of billion Christians who were on the planet in addition to those Jewish people, the scriptures that talk about Abraham's descendants being as many as the stars in the sky or the sand on a beach. Come on, guess what? They have come true. They've come true. Each and every one of you in this very room bear witness to that promise being true because we are all children and descendants by faith of the son of Abraham. I will bless you and make your name great. We ain't going to remember Tom Brady no 50 years from now. It's not going to happen. I'm here to tell you, we don't remember the people that we put on a pedestal, the people that we lift up in our generation. Most of them are going to be forgotten. We are talking about Abraham 4,000 years later. Do you think God has made his name great? That promise has also come true. We continue to speak about him, and one person was clapping. I am very grateful for that. Come on, Jesus. It says, so that you will be a blessing. All who bless Israel shall be blessed. And Israel will be a blessing to the nations. Continues on in our generation. It also says that Israel will be a stumbling stone to those who don't believe. But to those who do believe, Israel is a great blessing. Man, so many, even in the natural, you know how many uh, like technology things? Um, all kinds of stuff have come out from Israel. Just amazing, amazing, amazing. Every one of these promises has absolutely 100% come true. If we can believe that, then we can also believe when we bring this story to its conclusion on Mount Moriah, that Isaac goes up there along with Abraham and it comes time to sacrifice him on that mountain. God ends up providing a lamb. We call it in theology substitutionary atonement. God provides a substitute sacrifice for Isaac that day. They end up sacrificing that lamb there. As I shared with you earlier, if you go to the land of Israel and you roll the clock forward 2,000 years from that story to the time of Jesus, Jesus stands there and weeps and says, Jerusalem, <laughs> Jerusalem. I mourn over you. He stands in the garden that is there, the garden of Gethsemane. It literally, I've stood there. You could literally stand here and look right up there at Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount that's sitting right there. He's standing in the very same place, the very same place. And he goes to another tell, another hill, not far from that same one, and he stretches his arms out on a different kind of a tree, not the one that you see in the Garden of Eden, but a different tree that's there that would ultimately put him to death in an earthly sense, but he would rise again. And the Bible actually says that one day he will come back to that very place that you can all see with your eyes just standing on that hill. He'll come back to that very place from the sky back to earth to redeem all of mankind once and for all. But he says that each of us who believe in him if we believe this story, if we believe these promises and we receive Jesus into our lives, that we shall be saved, that we can live for him in this life and into eternity, that we will get to be in that heavenly Jerusalem one day, worshiping God forevermore. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? I pray you take God at his word. I pray you wait and not jump into something that you shouldn't be.
Father, we come before you, our hearts and minds in awe of what we've read and talked about here today. Lord, your promises are true. I think of just the land of Israel. I hope people were in as much awe as I was as I continued to study the realities of which I know to be true. You've made a way over 4,000 years for your people to occupy that place that you promised them. Yes, Satan tried to scatter them. Yes, Satan tried to kill them. Yes, Satan tried to thwart your plans. And he did a fairly good job for a season. But man, he won some small battles. But the war is won because your word is true and cannot be stopped and cannot be thwarted. So yes, there's these external attacks that will come on us as believers in Jesus Christ. But as we examine Abram's life as well, Lord God, we realize that he tried to shortcut the process a few times, and we're still suffering ramifications of those shortcuts in our own generation. Lord, I pray over the people of Journey Church today, and I ask you that if anyone be here that's looking to do something and contemplating something that would cause some eternal ripple effects in their families, that they would remember you and your promises in your word this very morning that rather than turning towards that sin and making a huge mistake, that they would do as Abraham did and set up a place of worship as they've done today, that they would put you first, that they would remember your promises and that they would praise you in song and praise you through the reading of your word and praise you through the fellowship of other believers, that their mind would be set right, that the new creation would come to fruition in their hearts and minds and that you would prevent them Holy Spirit, for moving forward into something that they know they should not be doing but are about to undertake. Father, would you thwart that right now in the name of Jesus? I pray for those who have already made some of those mistakes and are feeling the weight of it. Probably every one of us in this room in one shape or form where there's a weight of the past sin that we've committed in our life that's still rippling into our current lives. Lord, as you did for Abraham, as you did for many throughout the generations, would you cover that through the sacrifice that was made, in our our case, once and for all time by the blood of Jesus Christ, that the ramifications of our sin would be put to rest, that our tests would become a testimony of your goodness and your glory, that you would use it as a witness for many more people to come to know Jesus. And in fact, today, maybe you're here because somebody loved you enough to invite you to come here with the hope that you would surrender your heart to God this very morning. That you would dedicate your life to Jesus. That from this moment forward, you would say, I'm going to live for you with everything that's within me. There may be some of you here ready to make that decision right now. Others of you, you are believers in Jesus Christ. Your salvation is secured, but you know today needs to be a day of rededication. Today's the day where you need to just put things right and follow hard after him. You've heard his promises today. Maybe you've made some mistakes. And today's the day you know he's calling you back home. He's been waiting for you with open arms saying, come home, my loved one. If that's you with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, I promise not to embarrass you, but I would love to pray for you. If that's you, would you do me a favor and just put your hand up really high so I could see it? And I'd love to pray for you right where you're at. Is there anybody here today that wants to dedicate? I see your hand and your hand and your hand. Thank you, Lord, that you are moving. Thank you, Father, that you're moving. You are the king of the universe. You are the lover of our souls. Hey, I want to encourage you, if you raised your hand, I promise I'm not going to embarrass you. I promise I'll do nothing to embarrass you. I want to challenge you to just come out of your seats and right here to the front where I could join hands with you and pray for you and with you. And everybody around you is going to clap. If that's you and you raised your hand, come on up to the front. Give God a little glory, Journey Church. Thank you, bro. God bless you. Just stay right here. We'll pray for you. I saw a couple hands in the back. Come on forward. Come on. Don't be shy. All right, sister. God bless you. Give her a round of applause. Come on. Come on down. Love to pray for you. God bless you. Glad you're here. Come right over here. We'll pray for you guys. Thank you, Lord. Father, I stand with this brother and sister and the others who maybe raised their hand and we're a little bit nervous about coming forward. And Lord, we just mix our faith with theirs today and say, Jesus, you truly are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are none other than the Lord of the universe. And today we commit our hearts to you, our souls to you, our minds to you. Forgive us for the many times in our life where we try to take shortcuts to your plan that takes away all 
all sin once and for all time, that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Your word is true. Your promises are to be trusted. And from this day forward, we will live our lives for you in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus. And everybody says amen. amen. God bless you, my brother. Thank you. God bless you. She'd like to take a little bit of information to give you some next steps before you go. Give them one more big round of applause. Take these wrestling things with you and give them out. Let's outreach some people. God bless you. Enjoy today. Enjoy your family. And uh, God bless both the Eagles and New England. May it be a fun time for all.